Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O God, from whom all good proceeds, grant that by your inspiration we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding may do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. 
The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. The word of the Lord. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The word of the Lord.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. The crowd came together again so that Jesus and his disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus tells a story about a man with two sons. It's a familiar one, but I'll rehearse it anyway. Uh, one took his inheritance early, he left home, and he squandered all that he'd been given. The other stayed home. He cared for his parents, he worked the farm, he did everything that was expected of him. And each day, his father would stand probably on the porch, and he'd look out toward the road, hoping to catch a glimpse of his son, his lost son, finally returning home. When the day comes that he finally does see him, he runs to him. He clothes him in a beautiful robe. He puts a ring on his hand, and he throws a lavish party. Now. When the son who had stayed home catches word of this, the son who had been responsible, who had done what he was supposed to do for that entire time, he's about as mad as you can possibly imagine. Encounters with God's grace can be profoundly uncomfortable. Embodied exp expressions of that grace have the capacity to make us want to look away, to disengage. When we find ourselves as the recipient of that grace, the relief that we feel is so often muddled with a sense of embarrassment. And that embarrassment is rooted in an awareness of just how big a gift it is that we've received. And when we're privileged enough to witness someone else receiving that sort of grace, that sort of gift, we often feel out of place, like we're seeing something that maybe we aren't supposed to see. And we might feel anger or frustration 
we might find ourselves like the laborers in another of Jesus' parables, angry and unwilling to accept that their wages were the same as those other people who had only worked an hour or two when they had worked a whole day. God's grace is absolutely wonderful. It is joyful. It is glorious. Yet we, we who are flawed, who are fallen and prone to envy, sometimes see it as impolite, disruptive, scandalous even. Especially when someone we can't stand is on the receiving end of that grace. In those moments especially, it looks nothing short of crazy. In those moments that grace looks like madness, we can all take comfort in the fact that Jesus' own family reacted the same way. They heard what he had been doing, what he was preaching, and they tried to rein him in, tried to keep him from doing exactly what he had planned to do. Now, from their perspective, they were trying to help him. If he kept doing what he was doing and preaching the way he had been preaching, he was liable to end up in jail or dead. And they, like us today, wanted the message Jesus preaches to be suitable for polite society, to not ruffle too many feathers, to be safe, normal, and by all means, scandal-free, please. This tendency has asserted itself over and over again as the church has wrestled with the implications of God's good news for the world. God's grace, oftentimes, seems out of control and wild. And it is. And so we want to constrain God's grace so that it appears respectable. We want to domesticate God's grace so that it is polite, so that it has no chance of embarrassing us. But in doing so, in doing so, we put limits and conditions on God's love. And we do so in the hope that people won't call us out of our minds like they called Jesus. But my friends, that project to domesticate grace is not faithful to Jesus. Because it's that unconstrained grace, that uncontrolled grace, that leads Jesus to being labeled crazy and out of his mind in the first place. In the ministry leading up to the moment we see in this morning's gospel, Jesus repeatedly broke bread with tax collectors He preached the forgiveness of sins to all who repent. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. And just earlier that week on the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue and he saw there a man with a withered hand. And he called the man over, told him to to come closer, asked him to stretch out his hand. And immediately this man's hand was healed. Now, this man had not sought out Jesus as others had. He didn't cry out for healing. Jesus found him. Jesus called him to himself and healed him. He restored him to wholeness. And he did it in an intentionally provocative way. He didn't say, I'm not supposed to be doing this today. Meet me at the town square tomorrow and I'll get your arm healed. He didn't say, I've got these forms that I need you to fill out. If you just file this paperwork in triplicate, we can get this all taken care of. He didn't say, meet me down the street a little bit later today so that we can do this quietly. No, in front of the people who were trying to catch him at fault, who were trying to look for a way to silence him, he heals this man on a day he knew he was not supposed to. He could have done all of those things to keep it quiet, but instead he acted within the sight of all to further proclaim the boundlessness of God's grace and power. And it's an act that is consistent with the fullness of Jesus' earthly ministry. 
In Christ, God's love and healing are shown through his words, through his deeds, and through his very person. Jesus' response to his family's understandable concerns is not to pull back, but to double down. He gives what is effectively the mission statement of his earthly work in the form of a parable about a robbery. God in Christ, Jesus says, Jesus has come into the world to assert a new kingdom, to bind up the powers of this world that corrupt and destroy the creatures of God, to plunder the treasury of the enemy, to free the captives from their bonds, and ultimately to bring life to the dead and healing and wholeness to the broken, which is to bring life and wholeness to each and every one of us. Now, if we were all hearing this message for the very first time, we'd think the speaker had, in fact, gone out of his mind. By the logic of the world, the whole thing is ludicrous. But ultimately, ultimately, it is what is true. St. Paul reminds the church in Corinth to not lose heart. He says, because all of Christ's work has been for our sake, for our sake so that the grace of God as it extends to more and more people may increase with thanksgiving to the glory of God. The glory of God is the scandalous, uncomfortable, impolite, and ever-expanding circle of grace that has and continues to transform, heal, and redeem the whole of the created order. And it makes no logical sense. We can only begin to wrap our heads around it when we see it, when we experience it. It looks like God made human. Jesus Christ hanging on a cross for the sake of the whole world. It looks like costly forgiveness, a chance for a new life. It looks like a story Jesus once told about a man and his two sons. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world. Let us pray to the living God, saying, hear our prayer. For the Church, for the Anglican Communion, 
and for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, for the Episcopal Church and for Michael, our presiding bishop, for the life and witness of this congregation, for the staff of Sheldon Calvary Camp. Help us to speak of what we believe and to extend your grace to more and more people. Living God, in your mercy, <clears throat> for this nation, this community, and the world, for the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control, state and county health departments, and all who have protected us during the pandemic, for our country as we mark the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, for those who work for the well-being of the whole human family, for all who are harmed by evil, for those who serve our country, particularly Christine, Logan, Wade, Tress, and Robert, for their families and for the safe return of those far from home. Send strength and peace to all who wait for you. Living God, in your mercy. We give thanks for the 50th wedding anniversary of Joan and David Rollins. We praise you for the gift of love. Living God, in your mercy. For those who call to you from the depths, for Elise, Diane, Benjamin, Bob, Henry, Tim, Luke, Bob, Erica, Margaret, Anna, Nikki, Henry, Fairfax, Dick, Stephen, Linda, Paul, Tony, Paulette, Charles, Cam, and all those who have been commended to our prayers. For people suffering from coronavirus and for health care workers who care for them. For people throughout the world living with HIV and AIDS. For those struggling with addiction and those in recovery. For caregivers. For those whom we now name. Let your word be their hope, living God, in your mercy. For those who have died, for Tasso Spanos, Colette Wilkins, Lynn Cardwell, and Don Franklin. For those in whose memory altar flowers are given today, Pete Love, Lawrence and Thelma McKaig, Edmund Ruffin, Jr., and Jeannie Ruffin for people who have died from coronavirus and for their loved ones, for victims of gun violence, for all who mourn, for those whom we now remember. Bring them to the glory of eternal life with you. Living God, in your mercy. Almighty God, giver of every good gift, look graciously on your church and so guide the minds of those who shall choose a bishop for this diocese, that we may receive a faithful pastor who will care for the people and equip us for our ministries. We pray especially for Kim Coleman, Scott Gunn, Jeff Murph, Katlyn Solak, and Diana Wilcox, who have offered themselves to your service in this way, and for Bishop Dorsey McConnell as he prepares for his retirement in September. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. The glory of your name. 
Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Welcome to Calvary Episcopal Church in Pittsburgh. Welcome those in person and those watching online. Uh, as a reminder, the Reverend Leslie Reimer will be away at Sheldon Calvary Camp. The camp starts today. She'll make one trip back on a Sunday this summer, but will be returning uh, normally again in September. Uh, as mentioned, many places, many times, is the election of the next bishop of the Diocese of Pittsburgh. It will happen later this month. On Thursday, June 17th at Calvary will be an opportunity called a meet and greet. They used to be called walkabouts to get to meet all five candidates and ask questions. There's a way, uh, it's a requirement to sign up for that. We do hope you'll be able to come uh, very soon, next Friday most likely. We will announce an opportunity on the Sunday after that between services. Come and tell the clergy and lay deputies what you thought, what your response was to those candidates. Uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church in Pittsburgh, there are about 800 people from Ethiopia that live in the Pittsburgh area, have formed their own congregation uh, two years ago, and they will begin meeting at Calvary Church on Saturdays beginning on June 19th. There's some really beautiful and wonderful uh, images they use in worship. Uh, they will be in the refectory. You're welcome and invited to stop in and see those images there. Uh, I'm also asking what everyone thinks about wearing masks, assuming these are adults fully vaccinated. Uh, please tell me what you think, preferably in writing. I'm adding and compiling a long list. We have uh, mask wearing forever to I don't want to wear a mask ever again under any circumstances. But we're trying to uh, that won't work, by the way. We can't accommodate both of those. But we're trying to be as welcoming and hospitable as possible. Please let me know what you think uh, the best way to proceed with that. Uh, for communion today, we'll invite people with two communion stations, one on either side. Come up, please uh, distance appropriately. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us and offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin, become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemptional Father in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power, and glory, forever and ever.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, Lord Jesus, and dwell in my heart in the fullness of your strength. Be my wisdom and guide me in right pathways. Conform my life and actions to the image of your holiness and in the power of your gracious might. Rule over every hostile power that threatens or disturbs the growth of your kingdom, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord.